Okay, good morning everyone and assalamu alaikum. Uh, so after an exciting day one of our advanced interventional course, we move, move ahead in the schedule of day two. Uh, I'd like to thank our course directors for giving me an opportunity to stand in front of my prestigious colleagues and teachers and talk about coronary complications. So yesterday we had an excellent moderated session by Professor Abdul Hakim on the same topic. Uh, we are going to try to recall, reinforce and rebuild on the same information. So as an interventionist, it's important, imperative that you are uh, well equipped with all the weapons in the cat lab. So in management of PCI complications, please ensure that in your cat lab in the cart, you have a pericardiosynthesis tray, you have a couple of covered stents, coils and microcatheters for coil delivery, snares, thrombin or microspheres. In the room, it's always great to have a mechanical circulatory support device, ACLS drugs and defibrillator, contact information for individuals who you may reach out for uh, emergency support or advice. Uh, in the hospital, it's always great to have a backup, a cardiothoracic surgery, a peripheral vascular specialist, echocardiographer, and experienced cardiac uh, ICU care. So let's broadly classify the PCI complications. They're either cardiac or non-cardiac. Non-cardiac ones are related to your vac uh, vessel, uh, vascular access site, uh, your radiation and contrast injuries, and thromboembolic phenomena. Cardiac ones broadly are class classified into coronary and non-coronary complications. To name a few coronary complications, they are air embolism, dissections, perforations, pseudo lesions, spasms, equipment loss, entrapment, Non-coronary ones you deal with day in and day out, hypotension, arrhythmias, MI, tamponade. <laughs> so uh, to name a few vascular complications of the most commonly used vascular axis, radial and femoral, uh, some are uh, similar in both the uh, sites, however, there may be some specific ones like vasospasm, compartment syndrome in your radial artery, uh, your retroperitoneal bleeds, AV fistulas, lower limb ischemia, neuropraxia in your femoral axis. Now I'm going to shift uh, the format of my presentation to a more uh, uh, case-based uh, uh, learning and I'd uh, hope that everyone is uh, engaged throughout the process. Uh, you may look at the picture or clips and make a diagnosis in your head, so that's going to be a pre-test, post-test for all of you. So first thing I'm going to show you, and all of us can relate to it during early days in the cat lab, uh, we try and prick the uh, radial artery a couple of times to gain access, and this is what we end up with, a radial artery spasm. The picture on the left shows a spasmodic radial artery, which has been successfully nicely dealt with um, and has a good con uh, lumen after management. So uh, how are we going to deal with it? Uh, you already have given prophylactic vasodilators uh, via your radial sheath. You may uh, infuse in a couple more. You may moderately sedate the patient. A warm gauze above the uh, uh, vessel would help. Lubricious solutions may be uh, used. Or ischemia-induced vasodilation can come in handy. You may inflate the BP cuff in the proximal arm for up to five minutes and uh, induce vasodilation. However, sometimes your uh, sheath or your guider is so tightly held up in the spasmodic artery that may, uh, that you, even if you have knocked down the patient completely, you may have to ask for surgical help. Okay, so uh, all of the cases that I'm gonna show you are from NICVD and its satellite centers. Uh, sometimes you, you are trying to push uh, the guider through the radial artery and there's this razor effect how to deal with that, you do a balloon assisted tracking. You take a 2 or 20 balloon, 10 millimeters of it is kept inside the guider, 10 millimeter outside the guider, and you uh, track your guider uh, with the balloon up towards the coronaries. Okay, so the golden rule of uh, intervention, do not push or pull against resistance. We have seen this picture yesterday, similar one, a radial artery perforation. So let's talk about how we manage a radial artery perforation. First thing to know is if you have a wire proximal to perforation or not. If you do, say you have a guider in, you do a bad technique, you take it up, or you have a long sheet, uh, you go ahead with your planned procedure, so it which will probably last for 20 to 30 minutes, you would have probably sealed the perforation if it's a uh, small one and you can uh, go ahead complete the procedure. However, you have to do an angiogram uh, at the end of your procedure. 
Uh, if you see that it has sealed, so you can keep your patient in close post-procedural follow-up assessing for hematoma development or give patient a compression bandage, which is extremely necessary. If you uh, see that it's not healed yet, uh, you could consider protamine varies from uh, operator to operator. You could uh, achieve hemostasis via BP cuff, uh, but pro prolonged balloon inflation, covered stent may be needed, compression bandage, manual compression, or if the patient develops compartment syndrome, surgery needs to be taken on board. However, if you do not have a wire across the perforation, you have attempted it, does not happen, you go through all the same steps that we discussed earlier. So here we had another case of a 60-year-old female who had successful primary PCI to LED via right femoral axis. Four hours later, she developed hypotension. Bedside echo showed no pericardial effusion, no new STT changes, resuscitated via fluids. Uh, her hemoglobin dropped from 11 to 8. I'm sure you all have the diagnosis in your heads. Uh, she was transfused blood and rushed for CT. So in CT scan, we saw a bleeding retroperitoneal hematoma. She was taken to cat lab for further management. Uh, so here are some pictures where you can see the extra visition of dye. A uh, catheter was taken down uh, at that perforation point. Uh, foam, gel foam was prepared and it was uh, infused over there, taking care that we do not disrupt the main vessel flow. And in the in other picture, you can see that there is a control, the perforation has been sealed. Okay, so again, when you walk into cath lab day one, everyone tells you, please do not give this patient air in the system. However, it still happens. We need to know how to manage it. So this patient came in for uh, LED uh, stenting, and this is what happened. Now, the first thing you do is you give 100% oxygen to the patient immediately. A conservative approach in air embolism uh, may be all that you need. However, you should always ask for anesthesia backup. You don't know, next minute you'd probably be performing a CPR on the patient. If it's refractory, you can increase the map by giving pressors, IBP. You can do some physical manipulation also. You could break the uh, embolus with the wire or you could, you could also aspirate it via catheter. Now, key points to remember are that you have to ensure that all your uh, catheter devices are saline or contrast filled. A visual check to ensure back bleed after exchange of equipment is necessary. Next case, we had a 62-year-old female with typical chest pain for 30 minutes, an inferior STEMI, hemodynamically stable, who was taken for a primary PCI. So diagnostic angiogram showed a tight lesion in the mid-RCA uh, and a tortuous vessel. We engaged it with a JR guider, passed down the wire, looks pretty different from the first one, right? So luckily we had the initial uh, picture, so we went ahead and uh, deployed the stent. Uh, I ha we also had in mind diagnosis that you do. Uh, so we pulled out carefully the wire and we see a nice contour that comes back of the RCA. So pseudo lesions disappeared after removing wire. So this is a pleating effect or an accordion effect that you normally see. Okay, so the operator might have skipped a heartbeat. You've seen this picture yesterday, a big, big aortocoronary uh, disaster. So how are we going to deal with this? Uh, an aortocoronary dissection, is uh, the incidence is low. It's 0.04 to 0.06%. Uh, the classic combination that was shown yesterday uh, was RC and implants. That's the classic combination for this complication. However, any guide catheter manipulation can result in this. You have to avoid any further contrast injections. You do not want to hydraulically extend the dissection further. And now there are three classes, class one, two, and three. One is limited to the coronary ostium, two is a little uh, uh, beyond that, and three is more than 40 millimeters and may also involve the greater vessels. So one and two usually are uh, managed with stenting the ostium. That would be the sufficient treatment. You can go ahead, do a CT scan, a TE to know the extent of dissection. Or if it's class three, then some of them may require surgery. Uh, next case is a 65-year-old male who had an acute anterior STEMI. So LED was stented, post dilated with an NC balloon. <laughs> and whoosh. What do we do next? We have the balloon in the catheter. 
push it down, go down, balloon. Tamponar is the first reflex that should be done. Balloon was inflated. But even after that, you still see extravasation of dye. LS class 3 perforation, patient was stable, a covered stent was called in, was already there, and it was deployed. So a final result showed a nice, please sealed perforation. Patient was followed with the echoes, remained stable, and was discharged home. Okay, so uh, this may be an overwhelming slide for all of you as it was for me. However, this has been published in circulation in 2020 and I wanted to bring this up on this forum. Uh, let me walk you through this. So when we have a main vessel perforation, the first and foremost thing we need to know is if your patient is stable or not. Yes, you have a stable patient. Do you have a wire across or not? You do, you have a balloon, go ahead and do a balloon tamponade. For as long as the patient tolerates, it may be a couple of minutes, as, as much as 15, 20 minutes also. Even after that, if it's a severe perforation, you may need some covered stents. Uh, you may consider giving pro protamine after all the gear removal. However, that varies from operator to operator. There's no clear cut recommendation regarding that. Now, if you do not have a stable patient, the first thing you have to do is to maintain hemodynamics. You give some IV fluids, do an emergency pericardiosynthesis, type in cross-match, transfusion or autotransfusion, and notify cardiac surgery. So if you have a stable patient, but you do not have a wire across the perforated vessel, then uh, a balloon tamponade proximal to the perforation can be an option. Patient may have to go for cabbage. So moving on to our next case, we had a young male hypertensive smoker with an acute inferior STEMI who was shifted for a primary PCI. Looks like we have all the complications in our ACS setting. Okay, so a diagnostic angiogram of the RCA showed a tight lesion in the proximal to mid segment. An RAO view shows the same. So a uh, workhorse wire was uh, taken. You could see that it was a very small channel that we had to go through. The, uh, when it was attempted, we made it worse, uh, a, a dissection with total occlusion of the artery. So wire was upgraded, a pilot 50 was also attempted, but we could not find the channel and could not uh, get the flow across the artery. Uh, the, the procedure was abandoned here, patient was stable. Case was discussed with the senior, patient was taken back on the cath table and this time we went with a double injection approach. So a um, tapered tip fielder XT was taken and uh, RCA was wired. Successfully with a nice flow down the artery and a 3538 stent with a good final result was deployed. Now for dissections, I think uh, all of us are aware the, the, the most important thing is to have your wire across. If you have the wire across, you can deal with almost everything. So uh, you have the wire across and the vessel is open, you can dilate, uh, is open or not. That's what we need to see. If it's not, you can dilate with balloon and then you can go and implant the stent. If you're successful at that, go ahead and complete your PCI. If not, then you can consider doing cabbage, conservative management, mechanical and pharmacological support. However, if you do not have a wire across, it's like you're dealing with CTOs. So you are going to attempt anti-grade wiring with spring coil wires. If you're still unsuccessful, think about anti-grade dissection re-entry, retrograde wiring, subintimal tracking and re-entry techniques. Next, we had a 55-year-old male who was hypertensive with a history of non-ST one month ago, acute inferior STEMI, EF of 45%, again taken for a primary PCI. So it looks like RCA is the culprit everywhere. That's what I just noticed. So another RCA with a tight lesion in the proximal uh, to mid LAD, uh, mid RCA, a wire was put down, pre-ballooning 2015 with a good result. So a 3034 stent was deployed. This is post stenting shot. Post dilated with 35NC. However, when the operator was attempting to pull the NC back to the proximal segment of the stent, patient decided to move. That frequently happens. 
you see the system being pulled out in this shot. So yes, unfortunately, right at the end of the procedure, the whole system was pulled out. Re-engaged, rewired, and we took this shot. Can anyone tell what happened? It's a bare vessel. Where is the stent? So yeah, a quick review. Patient became a hemodynamically unstable, uh, started complaining of chest pain, so a review of the guider. Uh, we showed no stent, we did not know where the stent was, so we, 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 tried to re we tried to rescue the patient, put in another stent in RCA, and achieve this result. But we still have to scan the body, see where we left the stent. So uh, it was a 3 a.m. Uh, case, we scanned the upper body, the lower body, the stent could not be seen anywhere. In the morning, a CT scan was done, an overly stretched stent was seen sitting in the subclavian. Patient was taken back on the cath table, a JR guider was taken. So uh, an, a gooseneck snare was uh, used to uh, hold on to one edge of the stent and it was pulled back into the guider. That's a DSA of the same image. And the whole system was uh, pulled back and the stent was retrieved. Now, when we talk about stent loss, uh, you need to know what is the location of your lost stent. It's intracoronary or outside the coronary arteries. If it's intracoronary, you have to decide if you want to retrieve it or you want to leave it alone. Uh, when you think that you want to leave it there, then if your wire position is maintained or not. If you have your wire position, then you can go ahead and deploy the stent. If not, then you can go and crush it. Uh, if wire position is not maintained, then you have a couple of options. You first attempt to wire it, then you have your small balloon technique, you have snare option, you can twirl some guide wires to try and retrieve the stand. If all of this is going to fail, then you may need, and, and you still want to retrieve the stand, you may need emergency surgery. However, if it's outside of coronary arteries, then uh, and retrieval is not needed, you can leave in uh, the peripheral artery. And if it is required, desired, then you have to go through the algorithm that we just discussed. Now, we had another 65-year-old male hypertensive person with a PCI to LAD six months back who presented with non-ST and who was planned for an early invasive strategy. Okay, so femoral approach was taken. A diagnostic shot showed a patent sent in the LAD and a tight lesion in the OM. This is our focus. This is what we want to attempt. We wired it, ballooned it, and there was something fishy down there. Now the operator uh, took down the balloon and did a balloon tamponade, did an echo. Echo did not show any uh, uh, more than mild pericardial effusion, but we decided to put in a cover stand. So uh, this, this is the picture of the balloon tamponade. Here you can appreciate another axis was taken, another guider and a wire across. Uh, so a double guider technique was, uh, was used to deploy the stent, covered stent. Now a covered stent, like we discussed yesterday, a uh, bad thing about it is, is that it comes off its balloon. So yes, it did in the proximal segment of the artery. What do we do next? another disaster. So we had the wire across the stent, we took a small balloon, using the small balloon technique, we retrieved the covered stent. It was taken out, and you can see in the uh, blue picture, the covered stent is on the balloon shaft. Okay, so probably we are going to uh, save the patient now, put in a stand, go home, that's what happened. So let's just take a last check. And I'm sorry, we still have more to do. Another attempt at balloon tamponade. Uh, I'm sure this must have been a lengthy procedure, uh, but we finally uh, achieved what we wanted, a good flow in the artery, and yes, we did it. So this is a, a, a pictorial illustration of stent retrieval via small balloon technique. You lost the stent on the wire, you advance a deflated low profile balloon, you cross the lost stent, you inflate balloon, distill to the stent, and you withdraw stent and balloon through the guiding catheter. 
And this is the dual guide catheter technique for delivering a covered stent that we that was employed in that case. Uh, you have a guider a uh, wire and a balloon, inflated balloon at the perforation site. You take the second guide catheter, a second guide wire, and uh, you cross through the perforation site. Now, uh, when you have to cross the uh, second guide wire, you have to rapidly deflate the balloon. You take the coated stent over the second guide wire, across the perforation, and you go and deploy it. So to conclude, I want to tell you what is the most important thing. It's not dealing with the complication, it is preventing a complication. We may know a million ways on how we are going to deal with a complication, but maybe just a few things that we may know how to prevent it. So yes, let's not struggle with our equipment, try not to do things which may harm the patient. So prevent a complication, however, it still occurs. Yes, we do a lot of procedures, recognize it timely. Know your algorithms in your head, act fast. And I cannot stress enough, Please do not hesitate to seek help at any time. Thank you very much.